Minister for Communities. And we will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm committed to ensuring that those people who have rightful entitlement are receiving all the benefits and other supports and services that they are eligible for. Since 2005, my department has delivered benefit uptake programmes, and more recently, I launched the new three year strategic plan supporting people maximising income through the uptake of benefits, which has a vision to ensure that every individual and household across Northern Ireland is receiving all the social security benefits to which they and their families are entitled. Over the next three years, we plan to target 100,000 people with the offer of a full benefit entitlement cheque and secure at least £40 million in additional benefits. We have a number of approaches to meet these targets, including writing out to older people not in receipt of certain benefits, the Make the Call advertising campaign, roadshows held in local communities to promote the uptake of benefits, a team of community outreach, outreach officers who will visit the vulnerable in their homes to assist in making a claim to benefit and partnership working across government, the wider public sector and voluntary and community sector. Uh, we will be extending these programmes to ensure that support is available for people who wish to claim personal independence payment or who are impacted by other welfare changes. And between 2013 and 2016, under its previous three-year plan, maximising incomes and outcomes, a three-year plan for improving the uptake of benefits, this generated over £48 million for over 13,000 people. Mr. Swan, for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the update on those schemes. Minister, equally important in targeting the people who need benefits and are, are in receipt of them is also to make sure those who aren't entitled to them don't get them. He may be aware that up to 800,000 was paid to prisoners between the years 2011 and 2014, and since the system's upgrade, that data is no longer kept. Can I ask the Minister what steps he's taken either to recoup that money or to make sure that it isn't paid out incorrectly? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, the member raises an important issue, which I've touched on before, and that is the amount of uh, investment that we do put in, in terms of detecting fraud, detecting error, and often uh, there can be error in the system. Uh, but th there is significant investment put into that team who do proactively go after benefits that have been paid either incorrectly or indeed fraudulently. And where that has taken place, and whatever examples that are being uh, drawn to my attention today around those prisoners, I would expect and that if any benefit has been received, either in error or fraudulently, that that money should be recouped. Call Ms. Nicola Mowen. Speaker, um, could I ask the Minister, given that um, people can only avail of the one-year mitigation package when they go through the appeals process, why money hasn't been specifically ring-fenced to advise, to assist, to support them through the appeals process, and what guarantees he can give that money, much-needed resources and money will not be diverted from frontline advice? Well, I'm happy to look at the particular example the member is referring to around the, the one year uh, and the funding that's available. Um, in respect of fresh start monies, uh, there has been £2 million uh, each year over the next uh, four years is being provided to organisations that are involved in providing independent support. So people do get support whenever they go through the system uh, from uh, the Social Security Agency. But in addition to that, uh, this executive is putting those additional monies in uh, to organisations such as Advice NI uh, to provide that extra help for individuals. Call Mr. Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sure, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the launch of the three-year plan. Uh, can the Minister give us a greater idea as to that which he hopes to achieve in terms of increasing up, uh, uptake? And I suppose this probably really comes down to why precisely do we need an uptake plan, Mr. Speaker? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the evidence has shown the success that we have had. Uh, for every one pound that we put in, in terms of encouraging people uh, to get the benefits to which they're entitled to, you get a £12 uh, pounds return on that. So this is something which has a clear track record of delivering on. I want to make sure people who are entitled to benefits receive it. And often for some people, particularly in the older generation, uh, there's almost a feeling of stigma attached to people uh, claiming for such things. Uh, and we need to make sure that we break down those type of barriers. So I would encourage members uh, to encourage their own constituents to make that call. And if you're entitled to receive it, I would, I would much rather the money flows out of the Treasury 
and comes here to Northern Ireland and ultimately uh, would benefit our local economy. So over the next three years, uh, the commitment is uh, to secure at least £40 million in additional benefits by 2019, and that is directly targeting uh, a minimum of 100,000 people uh, to ensure that we have a full check on the benefits that, are in, that they are entitled to. Well, Mr. Philip McGuigan. Can, uh, can I ask the Minister to make an assessment of the Make the Call uh, campaign uh, taken forward in conjunction with Older People's Commissioner? I was able to uh, launch this event in, in Lagan Valley Island in Lisburn, and we had the Older Commissioner uh, with us uh, to, to join at that launch because obviously uh, he has an important role to play, and he recognises, as I do, uh, the issue around older people um, having the confidence to, to make uh, the call. Uh, but this has been successful, and so for older people especially, um, there are benefits there that you are entitled to and that you are not claiming for, and that there should be no shame whatsoever attached to those individuals who have worked all their lives uh, and often now in the twilight years need to get that support, and it is only but right that this campaign uh, receives our support. Call Mr Jim Allister. The Fresh Start document boasted uh, that there would be a ring fence £25 million to hunt down fraud. Can the minister give us an update? Is that money being drawn down? How has it been spent, and with what effect? Th this was in response. I remember we had a question from Mr. Agnew uh, around this, and there is money that is being spent on fraud. There is a specific team that is established uh, to deal with that, and so it's detection of error and also fraud. So uh, those monies uh, are there. They're going to be invested, and they're going to yield the results because we want to make sure that people who are entitled to receive uh, support receive it, and those who aren't entitled to it are pursued rigorously, and that's something that I intend to take forward. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number two. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's a UK-wide problem with cavity wall insulation uh, installed in the 1980s. The degrading or failure of this insulation affects all housing tenures, not just social housing. Uh, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive estimates that around 62,000 uh, of its houses have full cavity wall insulation and a further 9,000 have partial cavity wall insulation. No comprehensive survey of the condition of cavity wall insulation in Housing Executive homes has been undertaken. The Housing Executive will carry out a representative sample of cavity inspections in the future as part of its cyclical maintenance scheme surveys to determine if the cavity has been filled and, if it has, what condition the insulation is in. Dwellings, that are deemed, uh, that, dwellings identified that are deemed to be severely or critically inadequate in terms of cavity wall insulation will be addressed by the Housing Executive through response maintenance or through the planned maintenance programme. Mr Beggs, for a supplementary. I understand that many housing sector homes and former homes uh, were insulated using fibre and that there is a particular problem with fibre of settling and the creation of voids which can result in a cold home. But even worse than that, there can be damp fibre which results in a conductor rather than an insulator. So could the Minister assure me that there is adequate training of housing executive staff and contractors so that they can quickly identify where there is a problem of damp fibre in, in particular, which results in the ill health of, of tenants and fuel poverty? Well, certainly, Mr Speaker, I am happy to, to relay those concerns directly to the Housing Executive. I know I have been in properties where it concerns me about the condition uh, in terms of condensation and uh, the impact that that can have when it comes to damp, particularly where you have got older people and indeed young children. And so it's important that where we identify those type of severely inadequate uh, facilities um, that they're responded to, and that's something the housing executive does do in terms of its response programme. Obviously, there is a much longer-term problem in terms of the investment that is needed uh, in housing executive stock. Uh, that is something that impacts not just on cavity wall insulation, but on a whole range of areas within housing executive properties. There is a need uh, for investment, and there isn't the public funding uh, to do what is required, and that then means that there needs to be alternative solutions put forward. Call Mr. Jerry Mullen. Uh, can the Minister confirm the number of Northern Ireland housing executive homes across Northern Ireland where damp and indeed condensation has been identified as a problem and what action the Minister is taking to remedy the, the, this plague which has affected 
you know, Northern Ireland Housing Executive Home across every constituency in this Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm happy to try and get the information for the member in, in respect of the number of reports that there has been for damp or condensation in housing executive prop, uh, properties across uh, Northern Ireland. But as indicated, uh, it's something that I recognise uh, as a challenge for the housing executive um, in terms of the budget that they have, uh, in terms of dealing with stock as it is, and then the need to continue to supply new stock. Uh, these are challenges that the social housing sector is facing. Uh, it's one that shouldn't be uh, underestimated and indeed uh, as the Office of National Statistics reports I think it will become something that requires urgent attention. Well, Mr Oliver McMull. Can, and can I thank the Minister for, for his answers. Minister, most of what I was going to ask most of it have been already asked, but can the Minister uh, outline the steps that you will take immediately to ensure that the housing executive stock will be maintained? And those houses who have um, cavity wall insulation that are giving bother, can you give an assurance that that will be dealt with immediately? Well, Mr. Speaker, just to, to crystallise again uh, for members, uh, the housing executive has identified that it requires £6.7 billion of investment in its stock uh, over the next 30 years. Uh, so, break it down to the next 10 years, the housing executive needs £2.6 billion. Um, which is £700 million more than the housing executive expect to have. So the, the quantum of monies that we're talking about in terms of uh, investment in stock and new build uh, is hundreds of millions of pounds, uh, and that presents a very real challenge to the executive. Well, Mr David Hilditch. I thank the detail that the Minister has given us so far. Uh, is addressing the defective uh, cavity wall insulation uh, a priority for the Northern Ireland Housing Executive? Well, in terms of uh, responding to those serious uh, needs that are identified when uh, maintenance officers are checking facilities as a result of complaints and so on, then obviously there is a response to that. Um, and I know in his own constituency uh, there were a number of issues were identified where the Housing Executive looked at 35 properties in the Ballymena, Lauren, Carrick, Fergus uh, area. Uh, which had cold, or damp or condensation problems that were reported, and after investigation, including uh, bore scope testing, uh, these properties were found to either have no cavity wall insulation at all, or the existing insulation uh, has degraded. Um, the Housing Executive has advised that it plans to appoint a consultant to carry out a feasibility study for those properties that were identified. Well, Mr. Stephen Agnew. Speaker. <coughs> The Minister will be aware that a number of properties in Bangor were identified as having um, defective cavity wall insulation. A report was made a number of years ago. Can I ask what has been happening in the meantime? Well, there was uh, a report, Mr. Speaker, um, that was uh, carried out by the Southeastern Regional College, um, which the member may well be referring to. That was in August 2013, uh, where the Housing Executive appointed CERC to carry out that research to establish uh, whether there was quality and effectiveness issues with cavity wall insulation in its properties. That only involved a small survey of 206 properties across Northern Ireland. Uh, that, that report focused on the single issue in the very limited number of houses and took no account of the investment needs of other housing stock or indeed even if replacement cavity wall insulation was the priority investment needed for the houses surveyed. Uh, the findings of the report, therefore, whilst uh, not irrelevant, uh, have been superseded by the comprehensive data provided by the Stock Condition Survey and the Housing Executive's adoption of its new asset management strategy to shape its future investment priorities. Before I come to the next question, I should have informed members that question number 14 has been withdrawn. Mr Richie McPhillips. Speaker, question number three, please. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Jobs and Benefits offices across Northern Ireland play an important role in supporting unemployed claimants to get into work and to provide them with benefit information and advice. Uh, jobs and benefits offices will continue to play a key customer-facing role as universal credit is rolled out during 2017, and I can confirm that there are no plans to downgrade local jobs and benefits offices. Mr. Ritchie, first supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. This is an issue obviously has concerned many people in my constituency due to the downgrading of Enniskillen office and the negative impact that it will have on service users and staff. This is simply another case of 
Belfast getting it all and Fermanagh losing out. Is the Minister satisfied that following this decision that the decision of the Housing Executive to move its grants office out of Enniskillen, that rural proofing legislation has been strictly adhered to? And is he satisfied that those service users impacted will be able to avail of local services following this centralisation? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the premise of the supplementary from the member is entirely false uh, to suggest that it's Belfast first uh, and the rest of the country second. Uh, I represent, of course, the Lagan Valley constituency and always quite happy to see what I can get out of Belfast uh, seven miles down the road, never mind 70 plus miles down the road. Uh, but in, in respect of the issues that the, the member has uh, raised around the Housing Executive Grants Office, I know that there's been an ongoing consultation process being carried out, but I'm happy to confirm to the member uh, that as a result of that consultation process, uh, the Grants Office in Enniskillen uh, will be remaining and uh, the six members of staff will not be moving to OMA uh, and uh, there will be some uh, changes around how the service has been uh, being delivered, but fundamentally uh, the Grants Office in Enniskillen uh, will be remaining over, uh, open. Whenever you also touch upon uh, how universal credit is going to be rolled out. Again, the key centres for the delivery of universal credit as a result of the welfare reform changes uh, is going to be uh, the location in Newry, which is outside of Belfast, FOIL, again, which is outside of Belfast, and then there will be a Belfast element of universal credit uh, that is being delivered. Uh, and whenever we also take into account the announcement uh, by the Department of Work and Pensions in London, where uh, here in Northern Ireland, uh, currently, there are 1,400 jobs being provided to deliver services around welfare right across uh, Great Britain. Uh, only last week, I was able to announce a further 280 uh, jobs that is being established in Northern Ireland uh, as a result of uh, the work that we're doing on behalf of DWP uh, and GB. Uh, the majority of them are going to be located in Belfast, where existing services operate, but I was able to announce that 55 jobs were going to be uh, located in Armagh, and that came on the back of uh, significant lobbying from, first of all, my own colleague, William Irwin, who tortured me around it, but also other members, uh, Cathal Boylan, who came to see me, um, and there were other uh, representatives. Danny Kennedy also ca came to see me and uh, the SDLP MLA, uh, Justin McNulty, um, if memory serves me right, came to see me as well. I remind the member of the two-minute rule and call Sandra Overend. Mr Speaker, uh, the Minister said earlier that he was determined to uh, ensure that Northern Ireland people uh, claiming benefits can, can do so uh, as easily as possible um, and that he wouldn't want to make it difficult for them, but yet uh, there is a proposal to close the local jobs and benefits office in Cookstown. Um, if, the cons if the consultation uh, turns out to be a fait accompli, uh, can the minister assure me that the claimants from places like uh, Mid Ulster and their surrounding rural area will, um, who will lose their local jobs and benefits office will not be out of pocket having to travel to Markafelt or, or somewhere else to sign on? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Well, this is an issue where uh, my colleague Keith Buchanan has already engaged with me on this issue and expressed his concern, has been in to see me, and raised the very issues that uh, Ms. Overend is now raising here on the floor of the Assembly. Obviously, there's a consultation process that has commenced in respect of uh, offices in Cookstown, uh, Newcastle, and Ballon Hinch. Um, that, that is an eight-week consultation process, so uh, members of the public, members of this Assembly can engage in that. Um, and there is detailed information which outlines where claimants uh, are living, where uh, they would have to then travel in terms of potentially in Cookstown, for example, Macrofelt and Gannon, uh, and the impact that that could have on it. Uh, but there is a consultation process currently uh, being completed, and I would encourage people to avail of that opportunity to, to make the case. Call Mr. Keith Buchanan. Thank you, the Minister for his answer so far. Just to highlight the point that my uh, our members referred to, I would just like the Minister to understand the community concerns with relation to Cookstown, both the Social Security Office and the Job Centre. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the, the member, Mr Buchanan, certainly has relayed that to me uh, quite forcefully in the, the meeting that I've already had with him about the impact that it has uh, on the people in Cookstown. Uh, but again, I would say to people, engage in the consultation process. Uh, obviously, we need to ensure that all of our uh, buildings, and I say this uh, right across all of the offices that are being provided, uh, are fit for purpose, are delivering the service 
uh, that obviously the individuals that are availing of those services require. Uh, and as demand changes, as need changes, as indeed welfare reform is fundamentally changing how a lot of these benefits are being delivered, we need to be in a position to respond effectively to that. And at times that uh, does result in change. I accept that that then creates turbulence um, uh, and can uh, cause a lot of discomfort for some of those individuals that have to uh, go through that. But obviously I want to make sure that uh, we take into account all of the information that people will be providing as part of that consultation process. Mr. Sean Lynch. The can call you, and I welcome the Minister's announcement that the jobs will remain in Enniskillen. I just want to ask the Minister, will the, the workers be carrying out the same task or allocated different roles in the future? Well, in, in respect to the uh, position in Enniskillen, it was an issue that I know the First Minister uh, wasn't particularly pleased with whenever uh, she caught wind of what was being proposed, and it was reported, I know, in the impartial reporter at the time. Um, so they, they, the housing executive, they ultimately take these decisions. They have their own board. Uh, these aren't decisions that uh, I take, but I know, having engaged with them on this, that they uh, consulted with the staff. They looked at the properties that uh, they either own or lease, and in Inniskillen, they own their property. Uh, and therefore, uh, the staff, uh, as I understand it, that carry out the administration side are going to be kept in Inniskillen. I believe there may be a member of staff availing of the voluntary exit scheme. Um, uh, but obviously it's about delivering those services to the people and what I would say that whilst there will be a front office uh, available in Enniskillen, the actual motivation for some of these changes that the housing executive are taking forward is so that they can get out and meet the people in their own homes uh, because of accessibility issues for some of the individuals that require this support. So that's a service that's going to be rolled out uh, not just in Fermanagh and County Tyrone but in other areas as well. Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, can I start with you? question for? My department and Sport NI, an arm's length body of the department, are committed to providing facilities and provision for sport and physical activity in rural areas. At a strategic level, this provision is coordinated with the 11 district councils through the Sports Matter Strategy, which is 26 targets set under three themes of participation, performance, and places. Following a mid-term review of the strategy in 2015, an action plan was published identifying actions for key partners, including district councils, the Department of Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs and Outdoor Recreation NI, who all have a focus on rural development. The action plan is reviewed twice yearly through the three Sports Matters implementation groups. These meetings are chaired by Sport NI board members and are attended by key partners, including representatives from the district councils. Feedback is provided by partners on their actions across a range of themes, including rural development and reported on annually. In addition, I chair the Sports Matters Monitoring Group, which meets twice yearly and where I receive updates from each of these implementation groups. The system of reporting under the Sports Matters strategy helps to ensure that there is a joined-up approach between Sport NI and a range of partners, including councils, for the delivery of sports facilities and activities across rural and urban areas of Northern Ireland. At an operational level, Sport NI is a statutory partner in the council community planning process and participates in the strategic and themed working groups which are organised by councils. Sport NI has also been working in partnership with all district councils to develop a sports facilities framework, individual council area plans and a number of activity programmes including Everybody Active 2020 to increase participation in sport and physical activity across Northern Ireland. Mr McAleer for a supplementary. I'm going to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could the Minister give his uh, estimation of the number of projects which are being funded by Sport NI in local areas? I'd be happy to provide the member with specific details about the number of activities that uh, Sport NI is providing funding to. Obviously, there's capital programs that Sport NI will provide assistance to clubs. Uh, there's also funding where they're providing uh, support to coaches. For example, the Active Communities program, there's £13 million uh, providing 116 uh, coaches in respect of uh, the new participation program, Everybody Active 2020 in rural areas. Uh, £6.2 million of lottery funding is being invested across all 11 uh, council areas. £2 million of lottery funding for outdoor recreation facilities as well. Call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Minister, can you provide any examples of how Sport NA is working with local councils to coordinate the delivery of sports facilities? 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, with regard to facility provision, uh, Sport NI is currently working in partnership with district councils to develop a sports facilities framework and associated council area plans. As part of that project, councils have identified existing sports facilities within their areas including rural areas, and are also identifying the need for additional or improvements to sports facilities within their area. It is intended that the regional sports facilities framework and the council area plans will be used by all funding providers to inform the future provision of sports facilities across Northern Ireland. The use of the council area plan has already been used uh, to great effect to identify gaps in the provision of sports facilities that serve rural areas. And my department and Sport NI were able to work collaboratively with the Causeway Coast and Glens Council to deliver new sports facilities at Coleraine and Dungiven and to identify the need for facilities to be improved at the Joy and Lop Leisure Centre in Balamoni. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for Communities if he can confirm his support for the agreed executive investment in the redevelopment of Glen Torn Football Club and community sports facilities in East Belfast? Can I thank the Speaker for uh, the member for the question? Um, I was able to meet with Glen Torn quite early in office with uh, the Member of Parliament for the area, and indeed, uh, I think the Speaker uh, was with me there as well as maybe Mr. Douglas. Um, obviously, there is a consultation process that has been carried out in respect of the soccer stadia uh, and the funding with that and the specific strands. That consultation process uh, has been concluded. The analysis of that process, uh, as I understand it, is at the end stage of being concluded, and then recommendations will come forward to me for a decision to be taken. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. May I ask the Minister to outline the work being done by Sport NI in conjunction with the great Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council to promote a joint approach to sport and physical activity? And would he specifically look at the need for more facilities in the rural areas of Ballyclare, Crumlin, and indeed Randallstown? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, always happy to, to do more in the uh, Antrim Council area, particularly if those boundaries go through as proposed in respect of South Antrim. Um, so that's something that I'll be keen to look upon uh, as things develop. Um, but working with councils, I think, is, is very important to addressing uh, the sporting needs that exist. Councils often, at that grassroots level, uh, engaging with the community, can identify where the need exists uh, and where I can partner with local government. Uh, I believe that that partnership approach uh, provides a real opportunity for us going forward in the future, and that's something that I would want to, to look at and take forward. Dr. Stephen Farry. Question five, please. As the member um, will know, Enabling Success was launched in April 2015 as the last executive strategy for addressing Northern Ireland's very high economic inactivity rate. The current draft programme for government framework not only carries forward uh, this commitment, but has prioritised it as a key indicator for a range of economic and social outcomes. Over the summer months, my officials have engaged widely, but in a directly targeted way with a range of interests to develop a programme for government delivery plan to outline the actions that will be undertaken to address Indicator 17, which is to reduce economic inactivity. The delivery plan builds on the enabling success strategy and is informed by updated research evidence uh, from NISRA and Ulster University's Economic Policy Centre, amongst others. The proposals in the delivery plan will be the subject of a full public consultation as part of the next stage of the programme for government process over the coming weeks. The proposals set out are practical, evidence-based and radical, with a clear focus on prevention and early intervention set in an economic, health and well-being context. Subsequently, uh, we will tackle economic inactivity through a collaborative effort between my department, the Departments for Health, the Economy and Education, as well as the Public Health Agency, Health and, uh, health and Safety Executive, employers, employer organisations and other important stakeholders. Dr. Farry for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Thank the Minister uh, for that answer. And he will recognise that Northern Ireland now has the highest employment rate uh, since uh, records began in terms of the modern era, but we have still a long way to go in terms of tackling economic inactivity. 
Could the member conf confirm that uh, he will seek to, avo seek to avoid a, a long process around getting this uh, set up, which unfortunately his answer did seem to Im imply? And can he confirm that he will actually bid for resources to make this strategy real in terms of the forthcoming budget process? And indeed, in that regard, what consideration has been given to the monies that, was, that were mentioned in, in the Stormont House Agreement in terms of tackling error and fraud being directed towards uh, tackling e economic inactivity? Ask the Minister to be short in his answer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and the member rightly highlights in terms of the success that we are having uh, in achieving employment, but tackling those that are economically inactive is something that should cause us alarm in terms of where the, the figures are, because we are above uh, the UK average in respect of this. But uh, let me assure the member this is something which I intend to uh, take forward. Uh, however, I'm, I'm not convinced that tackling this issue is all about securing new money. Uh, we need to look at how we use existing funds better, how we better join up our health and work policy responses, and across the executive in the context of the new program for government, the new economic strategy, and making life better, the Department of Health's public health framework, um, to ensure that we're going to be really uh, addressing this in a collaborative way. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Ms. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, firstly, I'd like to ask the Minister, given the disastrous breakdown of um, relations between HMRC and Concentrix, could you advise what action you are taking to reassure those people who are in real distress, and I believe some have even been described today in the media as suicidal? Well, as the, the member has highlighted, this is a, an issue in respect of HMRC and Concentrix. It, it's not an issue that my department has got direct responsibility for. Um, but obviously, as uh, issues emerge um, and what help that we can give, that's something that I'm always keen to try and do. In terms of people uh, employed, uh, I, I mentioned earlier the, the contract that we've got from DWP to help create 280 new jobs. Uh, of which 55 of them will go to Armagh and the others are going to be in Belfast. So uh, within the remit that I have, trying to create opportunities for people to have employment is something that I want to ensure uh, is provided for in the future. But ultimately, uh, the contract to do with Concentrix uh, is a matter for HMRC, not my department. Does the member have a supplementary on it? Yes, please. Uh, given that the issue of child poverty and particularly reaching out to marginalised families who are no doubt the people affected in this, does the minister not feel a sense of responsibility to perhaps work and put up an immediate fast-track system that will offer reassurance to those people who are waiting to hear it today? Yeah. Well, of course, um, I have every sympathy for the, the impact that it is having. The impact that uh, that it is having in terms of staff employed by Concentrix is as a result of HMRC, not my department. Uh, and like any other uh, individual in society, I would like to expect that they would get support uh, from this department whenever they're facing difficulties and challenges. But ultimately, this is a matter for HMRC. They're the ones who uh, employ Concentrix, not me. Call Ms. Sandra over end. I wonder if the, will the minister uh, inform us if he is satisfied that the various uh, councillors in council chambers right across Northern Ireland, um, the members of the planning committee have received sufficient training um, to understand that they must make decisions as individuals um, concerning planning matters? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, elected representatives of local government should be familiar with the, the code of conduct uh, that they have to uh, pertain to. Uh, and obviously, when it comes to the planning committee as a, as a quasi-judicial uh, function of the council, that's something that does need to be uh, taken seriously. Um, so, in respect of that, uh, councillors need to assure themselves that they're acting within the remit of the code. And of course, uh, it's for the council to provide those councillors with the support that they would need. And obviously, where uh, people feel that decisions are taken incorrectly, whether it's by the planning committee, then uh, they can avail of the, the relevant challenge functions. Uh, that they, they can do in respect of those type of decisions. This is over end for a supplementary. Thank you. Um, does the Minister agree that it is vital for public confidence in the planning system that councillors do not act on a party political grounds? And in this regard, um, will he investigate the actions of Sinn Féin councillors in Belfast, who last week voted on block uh, against a planning application for a 30,000 square foot of a Grade A office space uh, near Central Station? Well, 
Again, uh, it's a matter for those individual councillors. Uh, they have to satisfy themselves um, that they are taking a decision based upon the evidence that they have before them. Um, in respect of the planning committee, I, I should say, Mr. Speaker, uh, planning powers is not uh, my responsibility. Uh, decisions taken by councillors in respect of planning uh, issues is a matter for those councils. And then the Department for Infrastructure has got uh, responsibility for, for broader planning functions. Uh, my department does have responsibility for local government, but the planning functions exercised by local government fall uh, more accurately under the remit of the Department of Infrastructure. Well, Mr. Philip Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the Minister will be aware that in 2016, sadly, lives were lost uh, on the streets of Northern Ireland uh, due to homelessness. Uh, can the Minister detail what support his department has given uh, to help those who have found themselves in this dreadful situation and to reduce levels of homelessness uh, in, in towns like Ballymena and towns all across Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this has been an issue that I have engaged on. I have met with a number of organisations that are involved in trying to assist. Um, those very vulnerable people um, who are in the position of finding themselves homeless. Uh, and so the Housing Executive it has statutory responsibility for responding to the issue. The Housing Executive's strategic approach to dealing with homelessness is the current homelessness strategy, uh, which takes you up to 2017, which has an overall vision of eliminating long-term homelessness and rough sleeping by 2020 and focuses on prevention and early intervention. The Housing Executive is currently developing a new homelessness strategy in partnership with the Department, relevant statutory agencies and voluntary and community sector organisations. Uh, the budget uh, for homelessness funded by my Department, uh, administered through the Housing Executive, is over £35.5 million, and the funding for the provision of homelessness services is £8.25 million, and £27.3 million provides homeless-related support services through the supporting People program. And the most recently published information on homelessness refers to the three month period from January to March this year. During that period, 4,350 uh, households presented as homeless to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, uh, which was a decrease of almost 300 from the previous quarter. So let me assure the member it's a serious issue. There is resource that is put into tackling this issue, and it's one uh, that requires our continual uh, attention. Mr. Logan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for that answer. Um, does the Minister have any plans to introduce any new programmes for organisations who help homeless, uh, homeless people, uh, particularly homeless people with addictions? Thank you. Obviously, there are organisations to which support is provided uh, to try and, and give that assistance to those organisations. I was recently in, I think it's Stella Morris, uh, their facility, uh, St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, who are involved in that, and, and they clearly have a passion for trying to reach some of the most vulnerable people who often um, have struggled to get the support that they have needed through the statutory sector. Uh, and here is an organisation which um, is getting support uh, that is having very successful results and turning around people's lives. So where there is opportunity to partner uh, with organisations uh, that are involved in this work, then that is something that I know that this Department Housing Executive will look favourably upon. Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, could the Minister give the House an update on the sub-regional football stadium funding and in particular timings around when that money will be able to be applied for? Well, in respect of the, the specific details, the sub-regional stadia programme um, for soccer took place from the 30th of November last year to the 22nd of February this year. There were 1,279 responses, 98 from named organisations, and then the rest were from individuals. Um, the responses to that consultation, together with all other relevant information, um, is helping to shape the programme uh, going forward. The proposals contained in the programme um, consultation document were based on the agreement to invest £36.2 million by the executive that was taken in March 2011 and reflected the five priorities uh, that were then outlined by the IFA's facility strategy of 2011. Um, the IFA did subsequently update their strategy in 2012. However, the consultation uh, was based on what was in place at the time that the executive endorsed the investment pros, uh, proposal, and therefore it was the proposals contained in the 2011 IFA facility strategy that were consulted upon. Uh, statisticians uh, have completed their statistical analysis of the responses 
uh, to the consultation in April. Um, the sub-regional Stadia team is finalising their consideration and analysis uh, of that report together with all the other relevant information uh, and that will inform the recommendations that they will make to me upon which uh, I will take then a decision as to how we proceed. Mr Lyons for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and can I thank the Minister for visiting uh, Larne Football Club uh, last week and um, for coming, to, um, for coming to, to Inver Park and to see the, the facilities that are there and the, the need that is there uh, as well. Um, it is important that the, there's many clubs across the country that need this money in order to keep their um, stadia uh, as it should be and to, to help them to continue um, to thrive. Um, can the Minister uh, ensure that the criteria uh, um, for the funding is, is made clear so that um, those that are applying for money know what, know what it is um, that they should be uh, saying in their applications? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, I've had the opportunity now to visit quite a number of different uh, sporting clubs and uh, have a look at their facilities right across a range of the sports. Uh, I know the member had me in Larne with his colleague Mr Hildage and indeed they, they felt it necessary to bring the member of parliament to that meeting as well uh, and so the case was made very strongly for Larne uh, Football Club. Ultimately Larne Football Club as with every other club uh, will be assessed against the uh, criteria when that's agreed. Um, far from me to be able to pick out preferences amongst that. I'm sure Lisburn Distillery would, would like the fact that um, I, I would be able to do that, but unfortunately that's not how it works. Uh, members will know that there will be a criteria. I, I hope uh, to finalise this programme um, and a call for applications to be made public uh, within the next couple of months. So hopefully before the end of the year uh, this will be a programme that people will be able to make application to. What I would say to members that this pot of money at £36 million, based purely on the small number of visits uh, that I have had already, is clearly not going to meet the demand that there is um, against this budget. That presents a challenge, I think, for the executive going forward in terms of uh, the type of uh, capital programmes that we would want to develop um, so that people will have an opportunity uh, to uh, make further applications uh, for capital to support the plans that they would have uh, for their clubs. Mr. Mervyn Stor. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be supporting people, which makes a, a very valuable contribution to the lives of many individuals, particularly so that they can live uh, independently. And the £74 million uh, that is annually distributed by the Housing Executive uh, enables more than 20,000 uh, vulnerable people to live in such an independent way. Could the Minister give us an update? where we are at in relation to the Supporting People programme, a programme which I believe does make a, a, a real impact on the lives of very vulnerable people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the member, of course, he will be very familiar, given the role that he did have uh, in respect of the impact that this particular funding programme has on, on what are very vulnerable people. Um, it does provide housing support services that enable these vulnerable people to live independently uh, in the community. Uh, the programme supports more than 18,500 people and it is funded by my department, administered through uh, the Northern Ireland Housing mm -hmm. Executive. The Supporting People programme, I can assure the member, remains a priority uh, for the department. In the 2016-17 budget uh, is almost £72.8 million pounds, and that was protected um, against the 2015-16 levels. Despite the financial pressures facing the department when supporting people budgets in other parts of the United Kingdom um, were greatly reduced. The story for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank the, the minister for his answer. He'll be well aware that independent research that some time ago was commissioned demonstrates that for every one pound spent supporting pr uh, people. Uh, produces £1.90 in net financial benefits for the executive. In, uh, and will the minister give uh, an assurance that in terms of moving forward, and given that there are particular challenges around the budgetary process generally and, and the various demands that are upon the budget, will he give an, uh, an undertaking that the priority that has been given in the past to supporting people will continue so that we to, we are able to see progress in relation to those who are most the beneficiaries of the programme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me reassure the member this, that this is a priority for me. Um, in my engagement already with the Finance Minister, I have been making the case that this is a budget that needs to be protected. It is very clear 
uh, correlation with the Department of Health. And this executive uh, has in the past chosen to protect uh, the Department of Health, and associated with that was the Supporting People programme. And so I've been making the case um, that it should be uh, protected. Uh, I'm also aware um, uh, the member had raised with me uh, before about pressures uh, that is currently facing this year in respect of this uh, programme. And so I have been able to identify three million pounds of additional funding um, for the Supporting uh, People programme, and that's coming from this year's uh, budget within my department that I've had to look at and assess where the need exists. And I'm waiting now for proposals from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive on how it would plan to use this, because ultimately it's the Housing Executive that has to stand over the administration of this funding. Uh, but I have made available three million pounds this year. Uh, to provide support to what I believe is a very important programme. That ends the period for topical questions to the Minister.